Let's talk a little bit about language. We're going to go to page 52. So I have this term that I use that I've got from wonderful thinkers in the past, which is phallogocentric language, and I already have a video on this up on YouTube, just a brief one. And uh, what it says is that phallogocentric language, the term itself comes from a language that is centered in the male phallus, exactly. So the word means what it says. Language is centered in the male genitals and the male gender, and I'm supposed to just accept it. I don't accept it, and so I'm starting to express the desire to be called gal, woman, etc. We also have a tendency to call grown women what? Girl. Girls. So this is identical, analogous rather, to what we did in slavery. We, we, we called grown black men what? Boys. We called all black men boys, and we especially called aged, elderly, wise, old men boys, black men, boys, as an insult. And it, it's crushing to the heart to think about it. Somebody who has lived and struggled and suffered and survived, and we can't even honor his uh, elder statesman status, and we call him a boy, to insult him. So the same thing happens by calling women girls. It is a diminution of their character and of their stature and of their status to take a grown woman and call her a girl. Um, bosses in companies used to refer to the secretaries as the girls. So that's why if someone calls you a girl and you're a grown woman, say, full grown woman, here, full grown woman, thank you. If you're over 18, not a girl anymore. Young woman, certainly, possibly, but um, let's change the use of girl. So we as women have to begin to fight back and we have to support the women who fight back against this and not say, oh, it doesn't bother me. Uh, I, I, I don't, I don't um, side with those feminists. I think those feminists are too radical and too extreme. No, the feminists are actually fighting for your right to, to respect and to dignity and they also fought for your right to education if you're a woman. So. All of you who know and love women, uh, the best, all the rights that the women have achieved have been achieved by the feminists, so women need to support feminism <laughs> because the best aspects of their lives do come from feminism, some of the best aspects of their lives. So uh, language is important and we have to begin to observe how we use it against ourselves because we actually mind control ourselves. When females, young and old, grow up in a world full of language that erases and degrades them. This contributes to their lack of self-esteem and sense that they do not have a place of primacy in the society. Furthermore, they are often interrupted or impeded in their efforts to use language, let alone language that honors them. The question is, who has voice in society? Who has the podium? When women abolitionists opposed slavery in the U.S. in the 1800s, they were barred from public speaking. So they organized the first women's rights convention at Seneca Falls in 1848. So that they could seize the podium alongside progressive men. Unfortunately, today, decades later, a few hundred years later, young women have difficulty raising their hands in co-ed classrooms, whereas male students display a remarkable sense of entitlement to dominate discussion. Outside the classroom, men of all ages display a remarkable sense of entitlement to dominate conversation. The average amount of time that elapses before a man interrupts a woman in conversation is seven seconds. So just see if you notice that when you leave here. You know, just count the seconds <laughs> on occasion. You know, see, if, see if you notice a pattern. Um, I certainly notice a pattern in classrooms. Not 
this one per se, but uh, in others where the ones who are oftentimes dominating the conversation and dominating it loudly and consistently are the males. They feel a sense of entitlement within the culture and it can be difficult to get the female students to speak. And it is frustrating. So the same happens at dinner tables, at dinner parties across the country. Maybe you've noticed, right? Who's doing the talking? Who's doing the majority of the talking? Is it the women or is it the men? So as it says here in this quote from Phyllis Chesler, from her text in 1972, she says, even control of a simple but serious conversation is usually impossible for most wives when several men, including their husbands, are present. So this comes from her text, Women in Madness, which has had um, repeat editions. Even if there are a number of women talking and only one man present, the man will question the women, perhaps patiently, perhaps not but always in order to ultimately control the conversation from a superior position. And you can only notice this, what uh, Chesler is talking about, if you're a woman and you start to witness it. It's hard to notice, you're not necessarily gonna notice this if, if you're a man because you're not feeling slighted, but you're gonna notice it if you're a woman. So my response to the above quote is word, unintended. I have witnessed this dynamic at dinner parties and uh, also at Thanksgiving dinners. So I'm just saying that even though I'm educated and knowledgeable, I, I can find myself completely silenced and shut down at the Thanksgiving dinner table. So I don't think I'm making this up. Uh, and we all have to begin to again assert our ideas and interject our contribution to the conversation. 